This is Lindsay Clark. I am your primary instructor for Molecular Diagnostics Lab. And this is lab number one for your Molecular Diagnostics Lab course. So this is a virtual lab and we will discuss laboratory design for a molecular lab because it is vital to accurate results and it differs somewhat from a core lab. I realize some of you may not be familiar with all the terms used for this virtual lab, but I want you to get an idea of how a molecular lab should be laid out. And this is sort of in a perfect world. So keep in mind that not all labs will have the space or financial means to create this type of lab. So sometimes we have to adapt and do the best we can with what we've got. So let's get started. The objectives for this lab are, number one, define contamination as it relates to a molecular laboratory setting. Number two, list potential sources of contamination in a molecular laboratory. Number three, describe unidirectional workflow as it relates to the molecular lab. Number four, discuss items that should be considered when setting up a molecular lab. Number five, state two methods for decontamination in molecular testing areas. Number six, identify activities that should take place in each prep or work area. Before you continue this virtual lab session, please make sure that you watch the video on preventing contamination. Now, the link is posted in Blackboard, but you can also find it at the web address that's posted here. The video features two field application scientists from Illumina. They are seen in the image above, and it's about a 10 minute long video. So the main goal in a molecular testing lab is to prevent contamination. Because PCR is a highly sensitive test methodology, it is prone to contamination. And the most important source of PCR product contamination is the generation of aerosols of PCR amplicons. Now, amplification products, which are the products that you have after your PCR step or after your amplification step, um, those can contaminate everything from benchtop surfaces and equipment to reagents and testing personnel. Because of this, it is important to know potential sources of contamination as well as how to prevent it. As mentioned before, the main source of contamination in a molecular lab is aerosols. And this can lead to cross-contamination between specimens, but it can also lead to environmental contamination and contamination of personnel. If your personnel are contaminated, they might carry that contamination from one step to the next. So it's important that they are not contaminated. The image on this slide depicts aerosols that are generated from a pipette, pushing the last drop out of the pipette tip. So this gives you an idea of how easily aerosols can spread in the lab. The big question is how do we prevent contamination in the molecular lab? There are three main strategies which include utilizing a unidirectional workflow, ensuring proper airflow, and by following strict decontamination guidelines. And next we're going to discuss each of these in a little bit more detail. Unidirectional workflow simply means to work in one direction. So that means testing personnel and specimens should flow in one direction without backtracking to previous areas. And the workflow should go from pre-amplification or pre-PCR to post-amplification or post-PCR. It is highly recommended to have separate equipment and PPE in each testing area and to have physical separation between each area. And this can look different depending on the lab space, the testing volume, and the budget of the particular lab. If space allows, a molecular lab would ideally have three physically separate spaces. One space for reagent preparation, one for sample preparation, and one for PCR and analysis. If space does not allow, two separate areas can work one area for re, uh, preparing reagents and specimens, and the other area for PCR and analysis. 
Now in this case, the use of laminar flow hoods can help reagent prep and sample prep separated, keep them separated, and reduce the probability of contamination. This slide shows a diagram of a molecular testing lab with three physically separated spaces. You can see room one is for specimen receiving and DNA extraction, room two for reagent prep and test setup, and room three for PCR and analysis. And the solid arrow shows the direction of workflow from room one to room three without backtracking. So you can see from room one, you exit go through the hallway, enter room two, exit through a different door, go through a hallway, enter room three, and then to exit the lab, you go out a different door out of room three. And there's no backtracking, so you're not going from room two back to room one. And along the top of the diagram, you can see the pre-PCR areas versus the post-PCR areas. So there's some dotted lines there, and the pre-PCR area includes room one and room two. And the post-PCR area includes room three, where your PCR is going to be performed, and then any sort of gel electrophoresis, your DNA sequencing, any other manipulations um, for your post-PCR products are going to occur in room three. It's important not to disrupt the unidirectional workflow, but it is also essential to consider keeping separate equipment and supplies in each area, as well as separate PPE for testing personnel. Now, if it's not possible to keep separate supplies and equipment, the disinfection of these must be stringent and it must be performed very often. And many labs do not have the space or budget to have three or even two separate work areas for molecular testing. In these cases, there are alternatives to physical separation, and that can include using class two biosafety cabinets or even a dead air box like the one seen in the image above. And this dead air box is called that because it doesn't have that ventilation system like your biosafety cabinets would have. Now, if testing is to take place in one physical space, it is crucial to have dedicated, labeled work areas, much like those seen in the video. Automated specimen processing and closed tube amplification detection systems can also work in small spaces to help prevent contamination, but keep in mind these are often costly and usually cost prohibitive for smaller labs. So next we want to talk about airflow and how that can help us prevent contamination. Proper use of positive pressure and negative pressure airflow in physically separate spaces can greatly reduce your chances of contamination. Now positive pressure occurs when the air supply in the room is greater than the exhaust. Negative pressure occurs when the exhaust in the room removes air faster than air is supplied. It's important to note that doors must remain closed in order to maintain a negative air pressure in a room. So in general, your rule of thumb here, positive pressure is used to keep contaminants out of a room, while negative pressure is used to keep contaminants from escaping. So let's talk a little bit more about that. If a lab has physically separate spaces and the means to set up proper airflow in those spaces, the reagent prep area should be positive pressure, while the sample prep area and PCR areas should be negative pressure. So the images here show the direction of airflow in positive and negative pressure rooms. Positive pressure essentially pushes air out while negative pressure sucks air in. So that's an easy way to remember positive pressure pushes air out. And finally, let's talk about decontamination in the molecular lab. And there are two major decontamination methods and one that is not used as frequently but is still effective. A 10% bleach solution is commonly used on surfaces and equipment and that is followed by ethanol or DI water which rinses the bleach off. 
and this prevents wear on porous surfaces because bleach can be abrasive. You always want to make sure that your bleach is on your surface um, for the appropriate amount of time for it to work before you rinse it. Now, ultraviolet light or UV light can also be used to can decontaminate surfaces, especially in biosafety cabinets and dead air boxes. A UV light renders nucleic acid inactive, so you want to make sure that there are no specimens left in the area before you turn that UV light on. Many of you that have biosafety cabinets in your lab, most of those will have a UV light in them. And the last method here is UNG, or uracil in glycosylase. And this can be used as an enzymatic method to prevent cross-contamination and carryover contamination. And it works by degrading products that have already been through the, pre the PCR process. UNG is commonly used in quantitative PCR testing areas, and we will talk more about this later in the semester. So we touched a little on what needs to be contaminated and decontamination methods, but let's talk about that in a little more detail. As previously mentioned, all work areas and equipment should be cleaned frequently. The PCR workstation should be cleaned at the beginning and end of each shift. All pipettes need to be decontaminated routinely and you need to make sure the exterior and the interior of the pipette are cleaned. In addition, to prevent environmental contamination, things such as doorknobs, freezer handles, exterior of instruments, and any surfaces that are frequently touched should be cleaned on a regular basis. Now, it's common to have a strict cleaning schedule in the molecule lab, and it is imperative that testing personnel follow this schedule. You want to keep your environment clean, clean, clean. Aside from unidirectional workflow, proper airflow, and frequent decontamination, there are some other considerations for setting up a molecular testing lab. Other strategies that may be used to prevent contamination can include the use of clean room floor mats, which are sticky mats that are on the floor, and they're meant to trap dirt and dust as you walk across them. This can help keep your floor clean. And the use of nuclease-free or autoclave water can also help prevent contamination in your samples. So if you're um, making your reagents or uh, manipulating your samples with water, you want to make sure that that water is not contaminated. Now many molecular labs will conduct um, what they call wipe tests. This consists of testing swabs that were collected from various environmental spaces to detect and identify the source of environmental contamination. A lot of times these are performed monthly what happens is the MLS or the testing personnel will swab different surfaces in the environment. So maybe the floor, the bench top, the doorknob, the freezer handle, um, the outside of the instrument, the computer keyboard, things such as that. And you will test those samples and you want them to all come back negative. If they come back positive, um, it depends on your specific lab's policies, but a lot of times what happens is you have to retest all of your positive samples um, all the way back to your last negative wipe test. Um, so you can imagine that gets kind of messy and time consuming, so you definitely want to keep your environment very clean. Now, as with most areas in the lab, you should also consider temperature and humidity as well as any requirements of any instrumentation in the space and you definitely want to consider a backup power system. So that brings us to the end of our first virtual lab. I hope that you guys gained a better understanding of the ideal layout of a molecular lab and why it's so important to consider lab design. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to contact me by email or phone. Both are listed here. And I just want you guys to know that if this, um, some of the terminology in this lab didn't quite make sense to you, it's okay. Don't stress about it. By the end of the semester, you should understand all of this and it will help really give you that big picture of the molecular lab testing and why it's so important to have a lab laid out properly.
And here are the references for today's lab.